Hi and welcome to the third video course episode of REST as in Hypermedia together with Java. This episode is going to be about the client side of the REST implementation. So again we will talk about coffee and now on the consumer side. So of course if you're a developer then there's a high probability that you're addicted to coffee as well. And now we want to consume the REST services we implemented in the second episode, of course with Java on the client side. So therefore, I um, have an empty project here, which will be the client project containing, well, for now, nothing, no dependencies. It's a Maven jar project. And we want to implement some logic here, some client logic that will later on access the REST service um, we wrote already. So we are writing a coffee consumer, which is just our main program and which will access the um, RESTful web service. So for Java, we have several possibilities how to access HTTP. Of course, there's built-in HTTP functionality right into the JDK. But, um, and there are also Apache Commons um, and Apache HTTP clients and other third-party dependencies. But what would I actually recommend for Java EE developers is using JAXRS for now on the client side. So you can perfectly use JAXRS in standalone client projects, just that it's using the client side and not the endpoints equally well. And the benefit of it is that if you're an enterprise developer or if you are working in a team with enterprise developers, then you're probably using JAXRS already and then you're known to all the APIs, which is um, a nice, um, so you don't have to learn a new thing. In order to do so, we of course have to add dependencies here. And of course we could add the Java EE 7 dependency, the API, as um, the same as in the backend project, but of course we need the implementation here. So this is the same as if we would write tests. That is the reason why I'm, I'm adding the reference implementation. So this, uh, the Glassfish is the reference implementation of JAXRS. And you could also use REST Easy or CXF or any other implementation of JAXRS. I'm going with Jersey here, with the Jersey um, client that ships with the client API plus Im implementation. And we need some JSON mappers here as well. This is the Jackson mapper that will um, map POJOs to JSON. And this one uh, will enable um, JAXRS to work well with JSONP objects. And this is the JSONP reference implementation of Glassfish. What that is, I'll show in a second. So we need these dependencies here, of course, as compile time de dependencies as we need it in our project. And then we can start um, writing a coffee client that will be used to access all the logic we have. And then if you remember the examples, we want to use our API. That means we need to um, get the coffee types and the coffee type origins and then order coffees. So first of all, we want to ask for the coffee types. And of course, this is not a getter, but a method that will return something. For example, our coffee types as string and now this client here will encapsulate the HTTP logic. And in order to do so, we of course need the functionality how to access our HTTP service. In order to do so, we will create a new client builder, a new client here, and then access everything starting from there on. So. The way it works, um, JAXRS on the client side is that you create a new so-called client, which will then access and build targets. So client target will create a new web target that basically encapsulate a URI and makes it accessible by an, an, an API. So here you can just either with a URI or with a string access a URL like our REST coffee shop. This will be the base uh, URL. And 
and then this target will be accessible as well. And I will show in a second why we need that. And then we can start to use our client. And if you remember the example correctly, then we need to get the types first. And in order to do so, I will go back to the backend project and show um, how it is used here. So in the same way as I showed in the second episode, we can equally well use curl or any other HTTP capable client to access our information, to access our coffee shop. And we will do this here with the types. And we will get JSON back and the uh, coffee type, uh, types plus the links. If you remember, this was the hypermedia enabled example. In order to do so, we will take our base target, which we already created. And then we will call um, several things. Of course, we could um, register some um, client side configuration, but for now we uh, only want to access um, the HTTP API. And in order to do so, we are building a new request where we can give a media type. So this will construct a new invocation as a builder pattern. And this invocation is then used to do one HTTP call. So one HTTP invocation. And the target, as I said, encapsulate the URL. And then we will create a new invocation to that URL. The request um, contains an overloaded method that accepts a content type, which basically will be accept HTTP header when we send our information. And then we can call several methods. Um, for example, I call a shortcut for get, which will be either a response or already included with a specific re um, response type. Or we can um, call more information. We could give a header and so on and so forth by a builder pattern. We can do an async invoker call and the new JAXRS 2.1, which is not out there yet, which will be shipped with Java EE8, will also include an Rx reactive programming invoker. If you're inter in, interested in that topic, I wrote a Java Magazine article for the September-October edition of the Oracle Java Magazine that um, shows the current snapshot API of JAXRS 2.1 and the things that are already there. So this is, of course, not final yet, but you get a feeling how this will look like in the future. But for now, we will only call get, which directly gives us a response. And this response can be then queried to get all the response information back from the server, which means we get the status code, the header fields, and so on and so forth. So, of course, we could now query for the status. And if we get an error, then we could handle it appropriately. Or we do the shortcut and say just get with a class name. And this um, will then assume that it was a successful call that gives a response that will be automatically mapped to a specific Java type. And in order to do so, let's start with the example right away. The same story is done if you call um, response read entity. This will then read our entity. In this case, it is an array of these objects into a Java type. That means we will have something like a list of, I will now call them coffee type. And the coffee type en encapsulate the type and the link to the origins. So we will create a new POJO, which is the coffee type, which has the type for now. And that's fine for now, plus some getters and setters. And this will be then wrapped in a so-called generic type. And the reason for that is that if you give them a class name, for example, list, then um, due to type erasure, it won't know that's a list of something. That's a list of coffee types rather than it's just a list. And then you can't use the generics. And JAXRS had solved it by um, giving it a so-called generic type, which has a little bit um, weird syntax. 
So you're creating a new um, anonymous class just um, for the sake of give it, having the type and it already encapsulate the correct type, which will be a list of coffee type. And this will be then our list of coffee types. And then of course you can stream the list of coffee types and map it to whatever you want to have for the consumer of our coffee client. It will give the type and then return it as a list. And that's it. And as our server is already running, we can now call the consumer and having the coffee types and just returning them. And now several things will happen. We will call a client here. Our client will access all the JAX-RS functionality and um, constructing a new request that has, has accept header cont and content type JSON, application JSON, and will call get and assumes that the response will be successful to or something and it will be mappable to a list of coffee types. And as this is um, a POJO, which should be mapped from JSON then, then internally Jackson will be used. And this is the reason why we added Jackson to our pump file. And then if we call it, then you will see that it immediately fails. And the reason for this is that it's actually this is was um, this was not expected. This is another reason, but that's always good when you do live coding because then you can explain more things because you know what uh, errors happen in real web projects as well. And the reason for that is that actually we queried the wrong URL here. Um, because if you remember the second um, episode, then resources was the start object, which is in fact an object and not a list or not a JSON array that can be translated into a Java list. And the way we solve it is either we query the base resource and then follow the link, but I will explain that later. So for now, we can use the target, which as I said, encapsulate the URL and we can also modify it. That means the target um, base URI will be resources, but for this request, actually, we want to have more. We want a resources slash types and we will call dot path. And if you remember the JAXRS backend site is uh, kind of similar for the URL and the URI info builder pattern. And the path with the types will add the path part to our URL. And this will then access the correct URI resources slash types. And then for the deserialization, and this is what I meant for the error, we now get an unrecognized field exception. And the reason is that Jackson per default, or actually all of the um, JSON mapping uh, frameworks will try to do as much, much as possible and is very strict in the beginning and say, oh, actually I, um, I expected my coffee type, type that only consists of a type and not of these weird stuff I don't know nothing about, like these links, so I fail. And you may think this is a good idea, but now um, actually a consideration comes into play because like I explained in the, in the first and second episodes, it now depends on the level of um, hypermedia and the level of being generic you want to use in your API if you want to be more strict and as an extreme example, just call methods over the wire, just call HTTP RPC style APIs and then being very strict how the request and response should look like and fail if not or you want to be more uh, flexible and more liberal on the client side saying okay I know that the server is probably gonna evolve over time and versions may change and there will be new optional fields which I should not care because I don't know them yet but still I don't want to fail and in order to do so we can tell our mapping frameworks, take these JSON objects 
and at least try to build something reasonable about it, uh, out of it. So you know that there's going to be a type and there may be something else, but just please ignore it. You may you need that type and if it's not there, then it can be null, that's fine. But if it's there, then please set it and everything else, if you don't know it, just ignore it. And as I said in the second episode, unfortunately, there isn't a standard for JSON um, to POJO binding yet. It's currently being involved. It's called JSON B. But for now, we have to use proprietary APIs. And this is why I included Jackson. And if you add the JSON ignore properties annotations to our type and say ignore unknown true, then it will just ignore all of the fields it doesn't know and still try to map it. And then it will construct a new coffee type and map it appropriately. Our coffee client will then construct a stream and get the strings out of it and give it to the coffee consumer. And that's fine. And if you want to include links, because that will be our next example, that we have our types and then we follow them. So um, the first approach of hypermedia. And if you want to include them, then we have to do more. Because now our coffee type should know about the URI to the origins. This means we want to include a map from string relations to URIs, which will be the links. And if you look at the output, it's the same story. You get basically a map from relations to URIs. And this is what we include here. We have our links map. That will be included in get us and set us as well. And then as our links attribute is called with an underscore, we can have um, the JSON property annotation with underscore links, which will then be capable of um, map the correct type. And then you will see that the correct um, types will be created as well. And we can query them in our client. So now we get two objects, expresso and pour over with the correct uh, URL to the types. And this is um, how the API is being accessed. So there are several um, conventions over configurations when using JAXRS on the client side. If um, you construct these um, requests and these invocations, then JAXRS is doing a lot already for you. You can just give them um, JSON, no, um, POJOs, Java objects, and it will try to convert it to JSON or XML appropriately, or actually to any kind of content type where there's a, me a message body writer and reader for it. Same story like on the server side. And out of the box, if you include these dependencies, then you, you can map basic things around. And then you can access all that information in your client. Another things to mention, is which I didn't mention yet and this is quite uh, important is that the JAXRS client needs to be um, shut down as well and in order to do so otherwise there will be memory leaks we have to uh, call it teardown and now it depends how your um, Java client is being structured um, but you should call um, close at the end. And then we can go further, as I said, in hypermedia. So let's assume now we want to um, use these domain um, objects appropriately with the coffee types and the links, and then give the consumer the actual coffee type objects back. Because um, imagine that the consumer will now select a specific coffee type and say, okay, um, I get all the coffee types back and now I selected, let's say, the first one and now please um, give me all the origins for that coffee type, right? So we can ask our client, please um, get the origins for that type. 
and then we'll include a list, let's say, of strings again. This will be the origins on the caller side. And then we will return them as well. And as we have now the links and we assume that the origins uh, relation is there, we get the URL out of this. So this will be the origins URI, which will then uh, can be used to follow this. And I can show you how. Now you can, um, you saw that there was a web target constructed out of the JAXRS client, and we can do the same thing all over again, saying, please construct a new target from that URI. And I just give it to you, the um, URI to the origins, and then we can um, go further on, like as before, with construct a new invocation. It should be um, application JSON. And now we want to have the um, second resource. And as you saw, types, we're doing now the same thing on the command line. We take the first link and follow it further to the origins. And this will give us then the bean origins for that espresso. So we can ex um, expect that there will be another um, array of these objects. Response read. And now we have more sophisticated uh, objects here. And we can um, also include a new type um, as well. But now I want to tell you more about the structure of, uh, of your client. Because as you saw, um, Jax, uh, JaxRS together with um, Jackson or JSONP is quite powerful and it can create pojos for you. But what you want to do and what you really want to pay attention is the level of abstraction, how you structure your client program and your real HTTP client like this class. Because it should not leak any low level HTTP information like for example how the um, responses and requests look like, so the response entities um, encoded as JSON, though rather than it should already map it to appropriate uh, objects that can be used. So what has been quite helpful um, in experience was using URIs as identifier, rather than in, in backend projects, you normally have pojos that consists uh, of your properties plus an so-called ID for entity beans and on a client, you probably want to use an URI, URI for this. And then this URI um, is already being um, provided from the client side and can then be used for subsequent HTTP calls to be used in your client already. That means, um, like I did for the coffee type, you want to include links that already point to either that object. So you could um, also include a URI for self which will be this coffee type like espresso where it can be accessed, if so, or include other properties. And probably not even as a map, rather than as a URI directly. And in order to do so, and I can uh, show you now this example for the get uh, coffee types. Um, so for now, let's continue with the other example where we do the coffee type with not the links rather than the URI to the um, origins directly. And now and if your um, URI um, if your API would be structured um, in a way that you could query the um, specific types, so a single type as well, then you could also include a URI to self, for example. Um, but for now, this should be our domain entity on the client side. And of course, it doesn't um, exactly um, is structured like the response, like the JSON response. That means we have to do some further mapping on the client side. And this should be done if you want that on the client side. And the caller, in our case, the coffee consumer, should not know about this. Rather, than it should use your domain entities and then give it to the client 
um, if it wanna, uh, wants to invoke some action and then the client should use it appropriately using your API logic. In order to do so, we can't read this as a list of coffee types because it uh, doesn't match anymore. Rather than we have a JSON array without this visitor, just a JSON array. And this was the reason why we need the other um, dependency for JSONP. This will be a JSON array. And now um, we can query the array um, to build a stream um, values as, which assumes that all the um, contained objects in the um, JSON array will be here, JSON objects. And then we have a list of JSON objects that can be a stream of JSON object. And then we map these um, JSON object stream to, of course, our coffee type. So we will, um, can include a new coffee type and we can create a new constructor with all the fields. And then assume that our um, JSON object contains a type and it contains, as we know, a links, a link to origins. That means um, you call JSON object links and from that nested get string for origins. And this will be then the new coffee type. And then we can map this to a JSON array. Sorry, map this to a, um, a list, a list of our coffee types. We get uh, our type and then we get uh, the URIs uh, to the origins and then we create our new type. And you uh, want to be careful here. We are always assuming things on the client side here. First of all, that our um, request will always be um, successful because if you call um, read entity, then it has to be successful and it has to match this um, POJO based on the content type. That means it has to be successful, it has to be somewhat JSON array, and it has to be uh, application JSON. And there has to be a JSON, um, a JAXRS um, object uh, entity reader that's uh, capable of mapping to JSON arrays. And if not, then there will be exceptions. So you have to be um, careful and you have to be resilient on your client side. So make sure that you catch all the runtime exceptions that can occur here. And depending on how you structure your client, either you try and catch it here and then wrap it to something reasonable or return an empty list and, and log it or however your client logic looks like. But make sure that this um, works. And if you have want to have more logic, and what I will show later on, then you can access all the information like headers or status codes here and react appropriately. But for now, let's want to con uh, let's continue with the example uh, with our coffee types. And then, as I said, you of course um, have the link included in the coffee type directly, which is nice here. And our caller doesn't know about this because now the objects look even nicer, even plainer um, from a Java perspective because you're not including links with relations and so on and so forth. This is just um, client logic. Now we can, uh, can continue with our second call. Um, we are calling the origins from our beans, which was this um, resource. And then let's say for now we only want to have a list of strings. So we read entities to um, a JSON array again, which is the array of these objects. And then 
get values as JSON object, just as before, do a stream and a map to the object, get string origin. And then correct, collect everything into a list and return it to the caller. And then again, we can uh, query this and it will now follow the link um, of our coffee types. And follow these links provided directly in the origin appropriately. Then you get the coffee types of the first, in this case, back, um, which are these two countries. And then you see that you already can include the actions here. And so if you want to follow this and say, now I, as a consumer, I actually want to order my coffee. So again, we call origins um, get first, and now we have our selected origin. And then coffee client order coffee for um, our type, coffee type, first one and the origin. And now if you um, remember the example, then the order coffee will get a, um, a response, which is 201 created and a location header, which points to the newly created coffee order. And this order can be accessed then later. So for now, you can then either directly query it and return the order object, this would be nice, or if it's sufficient, then just return the URI as business-related identifier. So then you define your uh, your URIs as the real business um, ID and not just the low-level HTTP level. So having that said, you're using your URIs, as I said before, for identification through all your whole um, client. But let's say it um, should return an order. So we create um, this. Let's say it's a coffee order from the type and the origin. And this coffee order now, of course, as um, we saw in the examples, will include the type, the ori uh, origin, and the status. And as I said, also an identifier. The type, origin, and then the status. And the nice thing about not coupling your client and the server side is that here you can um, really do, I say, whatever you like on the client side or whatever you would need on the client side, which means you could have your status as a string because maybe you don't even know that's an enum with just a couple um, of values. And you can use this example here just right away. Creating your new order and then use it appropriately in your consumer. Created coffee order, which will be returned. And in our clients, then, um, as I said, we want to order the coffee. And now we have several possibilities because I included the action here in our origins resource, which has the um, specific values already included or we query the very first resource, our root resource, which also has an action included. Um, of course, with placeholders there, because it's not, um, um, not determined yet which um, origin and which type you want to have. So let's do this for now. This will be the base URI where we already have the target. So if we uh, construct a new request, um, again with JSON, and then get, um, this request, will, which will be a JSON object, of course. And this is the root response. And then we know that the root um, response has actions, which has our um, desired action, namely order coffee.
and now we can query that action how it's meant to be used namely which resource we want to access and which HTTP method and um, data we want uh, we do need namely we can ask the action sorry this was not um, a JSON string rather than a JSON object and then we can uh, get a string which will be the method and use this method appropriately via building a new target client target and now we can query the action which href do you have and actually um, if we want to include um, JSON as well which method do you want to use and the method here comes from that declaration as well. So we tell him um, the JAX REST client, and this is um, that dynamic, that we will use the method, that's a string, it will be post in this case, and we either, uh, even can give them an entity. And this is how actions and not only get uh, links are used here. So we will include an, an entity, which is a body, and this body then is an entity of in our case a JSON object and our JSON object um, is created by entity this comes from JAXRS dot JSON or entity dot entity with a media type but we want to have JSON in our case and we will um, create a new JSON object builder as before and add the type, which will be the coffee type, get type, and of course the origin, which will be the origin provided in that method. And then by calling builds, we have our entity created, which will be then um, given to the JAXRS invocation. And then we will have the response back. And now we assume that it's 201 created. And now we can, of course, query if response get status info. And um, as I said, we can do this all the time get family successful, which means that it's two or something. Um, then return that it's been successful order has been placed and our response will include a header so we can either call and get header string or as we know the header is the location header it already has a shortcut that um, directly returns a URI and we can return that URI in our coffee order and then, as I said, you can either return that URI directly or for here now, we can um, go, go on further. And now we will do the negative um, way. If it's not successful, then in our case, for a runtime exception. And warn the client order has been placed now and as we have uh, the order URI we can now do another call and calling querying this sp specific order just as before and I hope now you get the story calling the target with the URI requesting JSON getting now um, the order which will be either directly um, a coffee order again, which we, uh, which we can do now just to show several uh, possibilities. Of course, in your client project, you will have to uh, have one structure all over the, uh, the time. So for now, we could also map it to JSONP and querying dynamically. So we have more, um, more flexibility. 
but for now it's fine to just call the coffee order and then having the order of course setting the URI from an order URI as this is not included in the response as it was the URI originally requested and then return the order from the client side and now we can uh, run our example again it says order has been placed the order is actually retrieved which will be accessible here it's an espresso from um, Colombia and if you remember the example it's set to finished already and if you remember the second episode we um, included some validation for example if we have uh, the missing type then you get the exception and it says could not place order status 400 and of course what you can do here on your client side for example you can query um, the headers to be then um, included as well in your debugging information and then you will see in our debug log if we include this information that it's status 400 and we know that there will be a validation um, error oh type may not be null so we better send it and now our example will run again and this is how you use these actions um, as well and if we move on in our example then we now created an order and of course at the end we want to have our newly created uh, uh, freshly brewed coffee so we have to um, update the order to actually give us um, the coffee so client let's call it uh, fetch coffee from our coffee um, order of course of co we would have to pull it and um, to wait um, until it's um, finished so it will be uh, prepared initially and so on and so forth but let's assume it's um, finished um, already as we coded that on the server side and now we want to fetch our coffee which is um, included on the client side as well this could be a coffee order again but now with the correct uh, status code after we um, made the put which means we have to put uh, for this and in order to do so we of course have to call our collect coffee action and in order to do this we, we have to follow these examples again so client target with the URI of the coffee order and request JSON and then get a JSON object again now it has to be a JSON object or something at least that includes the action and now as before we assume that there will be an actions object and there will be a collect coffee action which will be a put to a specific um, resource that means you can use this logic again but now either you take the values directly uh, from here so you query all the fields and um, provide a JSON object with all the values or you uh, put it there directly with the coffee order gets type and coffee order get origin um, I will just um, code this here right away as we here know how it will um, look like and the status now collected and then you call uh, the example with the method that will be a put and the body and you get the response and of course you have the same logic again saying call this um, check if it's uh, successful and now we have 
coffee has been collected. And we can enjoy our coffee. And our response um, now um, includes, it's, it's an empty response uh, to um, 04, no content. And that means we will have to call it again in the same way as here. Sorry, our coffee cat. The same way as before, because now in the real world example, it would be an updated coffee. But as it not it isn't updated, as we know, our um, backend client um, uh, backend business logic is just a dummy logic. We would have to um, fake the order to be successful, or actually collected as we did up there. And then it returns our coffee order. Coffee has been collected. And then it will be returned. Collected coffee now collected with the same URI. And of course, you saw several things that we have a lot of duplication here as our logic, how to query the actions is quite generic and is accessed in a similar or in the same way all the time. Although what I created in the first and second episode is not a valid officially con uh, content type, but you get the story and it, it's the same concept of having links and actions and however they, they look like. So the siren content type, for example, is quite similar. And you probably want to have some functionality um, outsourced, so single point of um, single point of responsibility that contains all this logic here. That you say, please perform this action, and it assumes that your content type looks, for example, like this all over again and it already knows okay if I have some action name then this is where to look and I know that this will be the method so I have to put to that resource providing all these informations these informations probably come from a JSON object and I just map the appropriate um, names and values and so on and so forth on the client side and then I have a kind of generic way how to perform these actions and I hope you got the story here as I said, um, some very important things. First of all, you want to decouple your client logic with your client, your client HTTP low-level logic with your client business logic. In a sense that here in the consumer, you're talking about just some methods that's going to be called. Give me the coffee types. Now I have to select one. This coffee type, give me the origins. I have to select one and now place the order and so on and so forth. And on our client, you have the lower level approach saying, if I want to have the type, then I have to access this resource. And starting from um, scratch, you would first call the resources and then even follow that path. Um, like we did our in, in our example here that you get the coffee shop first, the resources, and then you uh, query the links and go to types and then to orders and so on and so forth. Um, having that said, the client encapsulates all that logic. And if you go one step further that you say, we have this hypermedia logic, how to follow links and how to perform actions all over again. So we are writing another single point um, of responsibility that knows how to um, do these. And this is what I have done for the Siren um, content type, which I can show you in my JAXRS hypermedia project. So there is actually, um, it's called Siren for Java EE and it's not um, only on the server side but also on the client side. That means you can um, create a JSON client that just wraps a JAXRS client and then you can say retrieve entity which is a Siren entity which uh, I will show you in a second from a URI. That means there is a URI pointing um, to a resource that looks as follows 
and there is links, entities, and actions, and so on and so forth. And this is how, for example, the Siren content type is structured. You probably recognize similar names and there's properties. There's a little bit more meta information and this is the reason why I showed my examples in a little bit simpler pseudo HDM hypermedia content type, but it's the same story. And then you can um, get these entities and in this library it's already mapped into POTOS. So there um, are so-called entity um, types. And if I open the correct project um, client, we have um, a book client and it will, this is the same story like we have in our coffee client. So it wraps business objects like books on the client side. And then internally it uh, retrieves entities from a, um, from a target, from a URI. Internally the, um, the client will, um, wrap this as well and now I want to show you this in the real project so it's simpler to um, to showcase for example you want to find and now we're talking about books but it doesn't matter it's the same story here you have the uh, books and internally um, you have the client which talks about just the URIs as domain object identifiers or domain objects themselves and internally it retrieves entities and now this comes from the Java um, the Siren for Java EE functionality which says okay target that URI and now you see the same things I just wrote all over again give me the type give me the method encapsulated here in POJOS but actually it doesn't matter it could be equally well JSONP dynamic objects which includes um, actions and these are just um, POJOs included in that library that already contain all these properties. And the reason for that is that if you're using a more or less standardized content type, then you know what the content type contains and you know that there will be name, method, hrefs in your actions and so on and so forth. So you could equally well write a POJO for it and then access these uh, POJOs appropriately. And if you um, follow links, then it's the same story. You get the links and then um, you say retrieve entity and then you have the same story and the same is true for actions. You get the href method type, you uh, check the types and by calling it, you're giving an JSON uh, object with the properties because that is client logic. The client has to know what properties are there on a specific domain entity. And then it tries to perform these actions with the, um, with the properties. And what you could do in your project, um, write as, um, in the same way another uh, single point of responsibility that encapsulate that hypermedia logic and translates um, these either JSONP or POJOs to your domain entities, which, are, which contain only the properties you want to have and you don't know about links and actions. Of course, you need to know the identifiers. Um, this was... Um, explained in the first episode, if you're not constructing your URIs in the client rather than you're just taking your URI as is, as an identifier, then you would have to include it, of course. But uh, other than that, it only contains the properties needed, um, which is nice because then you really have a, se a separation of concern. You have your consumer, which talks just about um, business um, objects and business use cases. And you have your client who uh, really knows, okay, I need, in order to do so, I need to get the entity first, then I have to call this action and the action can be found on that entity and so on and so forth. The same way that I did in that project, rather than this is just outsourced into another component. And this is how you use hypermedia on the client side. So again, please um, think of two things, resilience, that anything can go wrong and it's a distributed system it will go wrong so anything can just blow up anytime which means you're not sure if that content type is really available and mappable from the server you're not sure if it's JSON you're not sure if your JSON looks like that and of course you're not sure if the whole server is available of course that means just uh, make sure that everything works here if you get exceptions then try and catch them so you don't uh, um, your whole client doesn't throw errors and the second thing is, if you're writing clients, then make sure you use 
separations of concerns, which means that you layer your um, client appropriately. And if you watched another video of mine um, talking about system and acceptance tests, you'll probably see some similarities because I also talked about layers of abstractions. And now the nice thing is if you write your client um, correctly or in a nice structured way, then you can use the same client in your acceptance and system tests. Because now you could just take that class if it's another project or use this as a system test project for our coffee shop and call these um, methods appropriately saying, okay, if I want to test my business use case scenario, this means I want to get the coffee type, I want to get another one, I want to get the origin, I want to place an order, I want to check if the order has been created and so on and so forth, check all the things that uh, if they're done um, appropriately and so on and so forth and of course enhance it with all the failures that could go wrong but this is a nice starting point and you can get um, really well written and maintainable system tests because you layer your um, client in a nice way that this can be reused so this is the nice story and actually this is a way why why i would recommend to use java and to use the same technology this is the reason why I use Java EE technology also on the client, JAXRS client side specifically. So it can be reused. And of course, you only have to learn the API once. So uh, as you saw in the other project, it's always client target request and so on and so forth. The same APIs all over. So now I hope you um, got the story how um, this is written on the client side as well and how Java can be used to access cool and hip um, hypermedia enabled uh, REST services. As I said, you don't need any other dependencies as Java EE or even plain Java. And you're ready to go to access anything. Either you're going with the um, POJO and POJO declarative mapping approach or with the JSONP and dynamic mapping approach as well. And if you want to um, read more about the example, I invite you to check out the um, JaxRS Hypermedia project on GitHub or the um, Siren for Java EE project of mine that is um, a use case, as I said, specifically for the Siren content type. And I hope you got enough uh, of coffee. And uh, on this topic and on other um, Java EE and enterprise related um, topics, I'm offering workshops and um, consultant uh, projects or trainings on demand. Um, so if you're interested in this, then just um, check out my website and um, feel free to contact me. And now I hope you um, got a good idea how um, REST as in hypermedia is used, where the benefits are, where the strengths and weaknesses are, how it's implemented on the server side and how it's implemented on the client side. You know that you don't need to use REST if you don't uh, want to and if it doesn't make sense for your specific project. And you know that you can use Java for cool and hip hypermedia REST services without any other dependencies, just um, use plain Java EE. So thanks a lot uh, for watching this video course about REST. I hope you enjoyed the videos and bye.